You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. So good day to everyone. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Georgina Shami, and co-presenting with me today is Dr. Christopher Brown. I'm from the University of the West Indies. I work as a lecturer out of the Institute of International Relations. And uh, Dr. Brown is an associate professor at Georgia Southern University. Um, we are doing a live presentation today, but prior to our presentation, um, we have one of our research colleagues who is a research associate from the Center for Criminology at the University of Oxford, Dr. Florence Amungal. Um, she is doing the initial video recording presentation and it's entitled Benefit of the COVID-19 Pandemic, the Evolving Use of E-Justice in the Eastern Caribbean. So that video will now be live streamed, um, Professor. Welcome to this session. I am Florence Simongo, and I have been given the privilege of discussing a topic that has relevance since the COVID-19 pandemic commenced. That is the evolving use of e-justice to service the needs of court clients during national lockdowns and stay-at-home orders. This occurred during the early phases of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I explain my findings, I urge you to reflect on your country's criminal justice system and to identify whether e-justice was in use before the pandemic, that is, prior to January 2020, or was it a novel and potentially positive response to the pandemic? My presenting team and I eagerly await your contribution during the discussion segment of this presentation. Your reflections will allow us to add valuable content to our consideration of criminal justice in a global context. When considering the Caribbean context, it is not possible to offer details of how e-justice was employed across the entire Caribbean region. However, I will extract a few points from selected countries, namely Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda. I will draw upon open source published content with respect to Trinidad and Tobago, but I will present data from my research findings in the other countries. It is not feasible within this short session to address all types of crime within the context of e-justice in the Caribbean. Therefore, I will focus on the criminal offence of domestic violence. The choice of offence was based upon a declaration by UN Women in April of 2020. This organisation said that there was a shadow domestic violence pandemic to the COVID-19 pandemic. This situation represented a conundrum. That is, governments imposed 
stay-at-home orders to ensure public health safety. However, the home was not a safe zone for many individuals in home confinement. I will draw upon interview data from a chapter in my book collection titled Domestic Violence, a Shadow COVID-19 Pandemic, an International and Interdisciplinary Perspective. And I will use this data when discussing Barbados, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda. I would like to use this opportunity over the next 15 to 20 minutes to briefly mention the following issues. And I hope that these issues will also engage your attention and participation during the discussion segment. First, what do we mean when we speak about e-justice? Was e-justice in use pre-pandemic? And if so, what were the benefits? How did the adjudicators of justice respond to this paradigm shift that accompanied the change from physical courtroom to virtual hearings? What do we mean by e-justice? There are of course many definitions and many perspectives, but for this purpose let us use a very simple definition. E-justice can be regarded as a specific field under the more general umbrella of e-governance. It is IT-based and relies on information and communication technologies aimed at many objectives such as improving access to justice, increasing cooperation between legal authorities, strengthening the justice system and improving legal institutions, and generally making the administration of justice more robust. In other words, e-justice can bring justice to the people at the click of a button. Access to justice increases the use of the courts as a form of legal relief, and it increases the legitimacy of the courts when citizens have confidence in their courts to settle their grievances or to protect them. E-justice can be integrated into e-governance, as we can see in the slide depicting Trinidad and Tobago. On the slide, it shows that citizens, non-residents, and other parties can access information pertaining to the acquisition of various state services, and this would include social welfare. We have heard the truism, justice delayed is justice denied. However, on this slide, we can perhaps tweak the truism to say that justice online is justice on time. So the filing of applications online is an added bonus which can be undertaken at the convenience of users. Step-by-step -step instructions are provided to facilitate this transaction. During national lockdowns in the early phases of the pandemic, online court engagement was not only ramped up, but was able to continue successfully in the interest of court users and court managers. There are many advantages in using an e-justice system, and some of these merits are listed on the slide. However, the list is not a finite one. As you listen to this presentation, reflect in your local jurisdiction and identify some of the current benefits or the potential benefits to using such a virtual system. We will rely on your participation during our discussion interactive segment at the end of this presentation.
e-justice in Finland and Tobago predated the pandemic. In fact, it occurred since 2005, and it was used in a variety of ways. For example, remand prisoners are located in the eastern part of the island, while the major court, the Supreme Court, is located in the western part of the island. Therefore, prisoners need not make this timely, costly journey from the east to the west of the island, but could connect to the courtroom via video link. It was used in certain circumstances, but not all, as face-to-face -face hearings were still very important. Video conferencing was used as part of IT technology in the following ways for case management hearing, to connect remote witnesses to trials, and for committee meetings and staff training. The use of e-technology can be used for video conferencing, as has been previously mentioned, but it can also be used for witnesses and victims who are children or those who are minors. Victims of sexual abuse and domestic violence are often reluctant to enter into trials where they have to face the perpetrator directly in the courtroom. However, they have been more inclined to use another part of the courtroom and to give their testimony via video link. In this way, they do directly have to face the perpetrator. Let us now consider the specific crime of domestic violence. What is the extent of the problem of domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago? Headline news and academic reports point to a link between the COVID-19 pandemic, essentially the state of play with the lockdowns and national closures, and a spike in domestic violence incidents. The problem of domestic violence in Trinidad and Tobago is also reflected in the problem faced in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Jones in 2017 stated, quote, In Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, beyond the ratification of a number of international instruments, domestic violence is widely recognized as a persistent challenge, unquote. So Jones is alluding to the fact that although uh, Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean and Trinidad and Tobago are signatories to various international treaties which offer protection against violence, we still see it as a persistent problem. The academic literature reveals what the nature of these problems are. These include gaps in the law to protect victims, both of domestic violence and abuse, the recognition of domestic violence as normative, and the treaty monitoring reports, which occur every four years or every five years, depending on the specific treaty sign, identified some of the problems that needed urgent attention. These included the high incidence of neglect, of incest, of abuse against children, the fact that the problem was exacerbated by a low conviction rate for perpetrators and the lack of attention and the lack of rehabilitation for victims of abuse. The dilemma was the lockdown, which was implemented to protect public health, also resulted in harm and sometimes death. Thus, prolonged home confinement introduced tensions, even in households characterized by healthy relationships. So how did the criminal justice system respond both, one, to the call for national lockdown and stay at home, two, with the increasing need of domestic violence victims who hated the call to stay at home, but home was not a safe soon. While well, some countries already had an e-justice platform or some semblance of virtual justice, and this made the transition to the virtual courtroom easier. Unfortunately, small island states, which lack the finance, the legislation, or the technology to rule out e-justice pre-pandemic, were challenged with the idea of implementing virtual courts during the early stages of the pandemic.
The situation in Barbados with regards to the virtual courts can be gleaned from the slide. We know that the courts were hearing urgent matters, but teleconferencing still remain an option, an option between the prison and the courts. You may recall in Trinidad and Tobago, I discussed the issue of video conferencing from prisoners in the East to the courts in the West. So in Barbados, the welfare of domestic violence victims continue to be provided by the state. On this slide, we have the view of how this hybrid system was implemented by the Royal Barbados Police Force. We also have the perspective from the bench in Barbados, quote, we did not do remote hearings because we have not yet made provisions for them at the magistrate's court. However, I can tell you we still have a culture in Barbados where the applicants for protection orders want to interface with an individual they can identify with." Unquote. So here we have an instance where a blended approach has been found to be useful. The view from the bench in Dominica reveals some of the challenges that small island states would face when they're first implementing a new technology. Quote, we had Zoom, then we had another. Sometimes we are doing them, the hearings. We would hit some technical difficulties and you'd have to move to another. The high courts in Dominica are using a lot of Zoom, a lot of virtual hearings. We are not using the Zoom in the magistrate's court. We only do it for a man, and everything else is face to face, using that restrictive time of half day courts. The view from the bench in Antigua and Barbuda was a very instructive one, and the pattern would have been slightly different from that explained in Barbados, in Trinidad and Tobago, and in Dominica. In Antigua and Barbuda, it was said. We really have not had any challenges accommodating face-to-face -face hearings because the numbers are manageable in terms of the overall caseload of the courts. The challenges we have had are with the virtual hearings and the technical aspects of it. Sometimes the internet connectivity may not be the best and sometimes during the middle of the hearing the connection might drop out. The notion of a blended approach was used in Antigua and Barbuda. In fact, it was noted that case hearings during the two-week lockdown period were undertaken via a combination of face-to-face -face as well as online virtual hearings, and case management proceeded well, as there were only a few scheduled cases. Throughout the discussion, the evolving use of e-justice was accompanied by an increasing awareness of the merits of the advantages in many respects. Here on this slide, we see very important benefits. The parties in the domestic violence proceedings are given a choice, so they're able to indicate if they wish to have the hearing done virtually or in person. More importantly, the flexibility of the hybrid system offers benefits to litigants. And this is a common theme throughout the presentation. And I'm sure it will probably be a common theme during the end of presentation discussion. So we look forward to your views. Please take note of all of the benefits that e-justice can potentially have for your jurisdiction or have already been proven to be a benefit in your jurisdiction and share them with us.
Therefore, as we come towards the end of this presentation, we are beginning to see that in jurisdictions where e-justice was evolving as a response to the pandemic conditions, they were regarded as a paradigm shift. They were regarded as a benefit. So as seen in the quote on the slide, before the pandemic, we never considered virtual hearings, the Zoom meetings and the Microsoft team or the GoTo teams and so on. That was something almost exotic. You never saw how or the practical application within the court system of that sort of technology. So there is this amazement and wonder and a sense of after the pandemic is over, there is no rolling back to simply the face-to-face -face engagement or the slow turning of the wheels of justice, which can be ramped up in e-justice. I began this presentation by considering how e-justice emerged or developed in response to the national lockdown orders and stay-at-home orders imposed as a response to the COVID-19 public health pandemic. As we can see in our travels across the Organization for Eastern Caribbean States, Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, administrators of justice showed immense appreciation for the developments of e-justice, the potential of e-justice, and the refinement of e-justice. One can conclude that it is apparent that despite some of the challenges faced, the use of technology in the courtroom was appreciated both in the present and augurs well for its future long-term use. We do look forward to your contribution during the discussion and I thank you for listening attentively to this presentation. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Christopher Brown at the uh, Georgia Southern University in the Department of Political Science and International Studies. Um, just wanted to welcome uh, everybody to the second part of our talk where uh, Dr. Shami and myself will discuss the global dialogues about what works in the context of Trinidad and Tobago and the ongoing Venezuelan migrant crisis. Uh, Dr. Shami will be operating the slides uh, for both of us since it just made sense to do one or the other, so she lost the coin toss. Um, so thank you. So, um, Georgina, are you ready? Yes, I am, sir. Okay, thank you. So the presentation that we'll be uh, covering today will address a few points. Um, I'll be covering the first uh, parts of the context that sets up how the Venezuelan crisis sort of came about, and then um, some preliminary impacts of uh, the numbers and the types of migrants that are uh, currently migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers that are uh, reaching Trinidad and Tobago. And then um, I will hand it off during the criminal justice system of Venezuela migrant section to my colleague, Dr. Shami, who, who will complete the presentation by discussing the role of NGOs operating the country and the UNHCR and the uh, I IOM. So. so I think it's important to recognize the background of the crisis, uh, specifically because this is not something that um, there's any kind of expectation that is going to go away anytime soon. There's no easy answer um, to this. So it's, it's important to understand how we got to this point. Um, um, and Hugo Chavez, uh, when he was elected um, in 1999, ran specifically on a campaign to essentially dismantle the existing 
sort of stagnant um, and corrupt democracy that was in operation. So I, I think there's a there's a, there's sort of a it's important to realize that this, the problems that were happening um, did not begin with Chavez. Um, they were they were problems that he was essentially attempting to resolve in some mechanism with his own um, his own platforms. Um, and then things have changed significantly from those days. So I think it's important to be able to look at a sort of a longer trajectory to understand how we got to where we got to. Um, in any case, um, when uh, Chavez chose to, to run for office, he ran on a platform essentially to undermine the existing democratic structure that was uh, basically um, hinged upon a handful of parties, mainly two parties that had sort of a, a lock uh, on uh, the political economy of the country. One of the biggest issues with Venezuela historically, at least in the modern history, has been that it has a um, it has a lot of oil reserves, a lot of petroleum and natural gas reserves. However, the political economy is heavily tied to that. So in the past, when the economy, the, when the oil prices were good, there was a lot of money to be spent. Unfortunately, over the course of time, that money wasn't sown properly um, and it wasn't used to diversify the economy sufficiently. So our story of Venezuela's decline uh, is one that's related to oil prices, unfortunately, because of the over overexposure to commodity prices for petroleum reserves. So uh, when Chavez took over, prices for oil had actually doubled, uh, which allowed him to go forward with it, the elements of his Bolivar and socialism. He was able to in incorporate a lot of the programs, particularly programs for people who had been marginalized in the previous political system. So there was greater access to, um, to, to uh, poorer areas, um, greater access to remote areas and things like that. And a lot of uh, massive social programs um, uh, were launched in the country. And as a result of that, it facilitated a lot of people to become politicized, um, oftentimes to a, a sort of a, a militarization of society in favor of, of Chavez's uh, uh, social programming. So um, with this new wealth and international prestige, uh, Chavez made significant efforts in an attempt to sort of uh, publicized many parts of the economy that had been privatized um, and that were, weren't necessarily working functionally for the for the benefit of the poorer people or the larger uh, population at large. Um, and in doing so, there was a series of nationalizations. And this was in line with his, his notion of socialism, the Boulevard and socialism, land grabs, undermining private enterprises and things. And as a result of that, there became a, a centralization of the economic resources, mainly by Chavez and uh, the folks that were surrounding him. Um, on top of that, the, there was a shift as a result of the rhetoric, the policies, and the pressures on both sides. The United States uh, policy toward the Chavez regime um, led Chavez somewhat naturally to lean more heavily on Cuba, Russia, and China uh, for assistance, management, and um, exploration rights for oil and natural gas. With each, each effort to sort of consolidate political economic power, there was also one that came with political power. And as Chavez was uh, basically threatened, by different political forces, he tightened control. So over the course of time, what you see is sort of a spiraling authoritarianism, which leads to increased economic, uh, increased economic centralization and decreased um, basically political rights for most folks. So one of the other impacts of, of uh, Chavez's programs, while well-intentioned, was to be able to provide for foodstuffs at a reasonable rate so that everyone could afford them. Unfortunately, economically, the way that worked out is the price controls that were set ultimately made it too, um, too cheap to be able to produce goods locally. And as a result of that, uh, their affordability, their cost to produce them exceeded the profits for producers. Um, and so which required then that the, um, in order to maintain um, you know, products and services, they had to rely on foreign reserves to be able to buy the things that were no longer being produced locally. Uh, Hugo Chavez dies and names his successor, Nicolas Maduro. Uh, Maduro takes over um, and shortly after his, his um, appointment and then his uh, subsequent election, uh, there was a decline, significant decline in oil prices. The decline in oil prices came at a time where uh, the general money that was generating was obviously less, but at the same time, due to a series of policies that ended up neglecting the infrastructure, led to a... Um, a decline, in the, a decline in the quality and the output for whatever oil pr was being produced. And so this, uh, between the, the global commodity prices and the internal inattention to maintaining the industry, essentially the, the, uh, the foreign reserves that were coming in 
were being spent quite rapidly. And again, with Venezuela being heavily tied to oil and natural gas export as a basis for its revenue stream, um, this is problematic without the diversification. So uh, with the decline in prices and the lack of domestic incentive, there was no nothing to be able to be produced um, at, and locally. So people couldn't buy what they needed. And when they could, they'd spent their dollars to try to get it, which ate up a, lot, a good bit of their reserves. Um, and as a result, there was an increasing uh, shortage of critical goods, uh, basic foodstuffs and, and everything else uh, that has continued to this day and has only been it's really only gotten worse. Um, the subsequent policies that were made again and more rounds of, of consolidation, more rounds of economic repression. There was a referendum back and forth at efforts of Guaido to try to the opposition leader to try to take over in a constitutional crisis. And ultimately where we are today is um, Venezuela has a massive hyperinflation, widespread disease because there's no money to manage the, the clinics. There is escalating starvation. There's no goods. There's no, uh, there's no um, critical, critical goods. There's no food. Um, crime is rampant. In fact, uh, the country, the political system itself is, has largely, um, in order to get that extra cash that it's needed to maintain itself, has allowed criminal gangs to operate with a free hand. So um, the, the Maduro regime is it's almost sort of like a like a godfather type situation now where there's several different criminal and guerrilla groups operating in the country that provide revenue stream as long as they can operate within their jurisdiction. Um, the complete collapse of infrastructure, medical care, government spending, and, um, and personal crimes, just, just regular crime itself has become so widespread that um, it's just not safe for most people to remain there. And as a result, if we can't stay, there's no, no, nothing we can do to provide support for our families, people leave. So apparently, approximately, excuse me, 6 million Venezuelans have left. Um, this is a mixed migration, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but just, just given the size of um, the recipient countries, particularly those that are close by uh, in Trinidad and, and smaller, smaller island um, entities like Bonaire and Curacao, and um, these are significant populations that are arriving um, in countries that are historically not used to um, being receiving states for migration. These are sending countries. Um, and so um, if uh, at this point, hopefully you're familiar with Trinidad and Tobago, if not, it's the southernmost Caribbean islands. Uh, what does this mean? It's a very short boat ride off the coast of Venezuela. Uh, and, in, and in good times, uh, the communities there would, would interact back and forth. It wouldn't be uncommon to see people uh, sending pirogues back and forth, uh, canoes back and forth, essentially buying goods from one country or, or another. Um, today, um, you see a whole lot more uh, traffic, um, and now that traffic is generally managed by, not so much by fishermen at this point, but by criminal gangs. But um, in, in short, it's so close, it's easy to get to uh, for most folks. Um, and that's, it, it's, it's basically a place that is not Venezuela, that's close enough for folks to get to. So um, there's been different um, migrations um, from, from over the course of time, and some of these migrations have been return migrations as well. So what you saw initially was that it was sort of younger, um, younger men leaving for lack of opportunity uh, for safety purposes to be able to provide uh, a living uh, and then send home remittances uh, in some sort back home. And then increasingly they're being joined by families. So we're starting to see a lot more reunification migration. Um, again, being so close, most of them come by boat. Uh, naturally, um, most of them speak Spanish, although there is a significant um, a more recent significant group of indigenous uh, folks who are moving in from the Orinoco Delta who, who may or may not speak Spanish. So um, this is a mixed migration. Like I said, there's a significant number of families. There's a lot of separated children, people with health problems that can't get health access in, in Venezuela because it just doesn't exist, or they don't have the money to access that level of power um, to be able to acquire those things. And then people with special needs. So um, the... So one of the major issues that a lot of the folks who are coming over, because of the lack of infrastructure in Venezuela, many of the folks don't have the adequate documentation that they would need to be able to progress through formalized uh, procedures for immigration. And so this is a big issue because if they can't identify themselves, then it, it has a knock-on effect down the road with you know, being able to provide um, services and getting to school and certificates for uh, work qualifications or educational qualifications. So. Um, most of them, uh, or a fair number of them, have a, uh, some education. Um, however, there's a significant number of children um, as well. So this isn't a, um, 
as the um, the number of migrants come, the different uh, flows of migrants and family um, family migration or family reunion migrations increases, um, the 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 types of migrants have shifted. So some of the um, some of the challenges of the of the the migrants themselves, refugees, asylum seekers themselves, um, they're essentially their status is uh, one of being illegal. Uh, there's because they don't have a recognized a uh, formal agreement for migration, their status remains illegal um, from the minute they decide to sort of leave Venezuela until um, they return, which many of them do not. And so um, they're subject to a series of uh, criminal justice um, pathways that um, they can't necessarily escape because of their, their by their very nature. So I think it's important to realize that fundamentally, because there's a lack of a framework for migration in this context, um, everyone's considered a criminal, right? There's different levels of criminality, um, which if criminals are already operating, um, the criminals are, have taken over many of the transit mechanisms for folks um, who leave, they manage the migration and they're beginning to manage it on both sides in conjunction with criminal gangs in Trinidad and Tobago. And so you're starting to see all of those behaviors that um, vulnerable people are subjected to uh, the trafficking and 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 worse um, that are occurring in the in the context of this. So the very thing, the, the vulnerability of these folks um, coming over, especially children, um, younger children, is 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 quite serious. Um, secondly, um, as a result of sort of being in a new new group of people who um, have a, a, a questionable legal right to be there on the surface of it find themselves in a discriminatory uh, context when they arrive. And this has gotten significantly worse. Um, part of this is COVID frustration. Many of the uh, opportunities that migrants had were, would have been in, in places where have been would have been significantly impacted by COVID. Uh, things like construction, um, bar, restaurant, uh, ho uh, hospital, or hospitality areas and things. Um, and so a lot of the migrants would have lost their jobs in this context that, and they can't get other work. So it's become sort of a problem. They've been sort of, sort of seen as a drain, uh, which has been taken up by a lot of the NGOs that my colleague, Dr. Shami, will talk about in terms of managing that process. But um, I think it's important for, for folks who don't realize Trinidad is a, it's an amazing place. It's a very diverse place, but there's a significant um, um, ethno-religion religion, uh, groups that um, in, in significant size ethno-religious groups that are also activated in a political context. Uh, and so uh, due to its historical trajectory, there's a significant percentage of Afro-Caribbeans, there's, there's uh, Indian trainees, uh, or Indian training from uh, the Indian Pakistan, um, and then there's a variety of other groups. And so this group here represents a totally different group from the ones that are pre-existing at this point in time or coexisting uh, for the most part quite well, um, out, if, despite what the papers might say. Um, outside of the, um, this group is it's Spanish speaking, Right, and that is sort of the it's it's just a different group. This is nominally Catholic, Spanish speaking, um, and um, you know have a completely different um, cultural awareness. Uh, like I said, there has not been um, an, a formal incorporation of the existing agreements that are out there in international law. Um, they have recently agreed upon them. Um, generally, but they have not done anything to incorporate them into the law of the land. And so uh, as a result, um, everyone is undocumented. And as a result of that, everyone is in some sort of degree of criminality. And we've talked about mixed movement here. Uh, I won't, I won't um, overdo it because uh, you, you can see the slideshow here. Um, and so one of the bigger issues of because of the criminality, because of the lack of, of documentation, most of the new arrivals are unable to legally access work or public education. Um, and so the, the, when it initially, um, sort of shortly, I guess, within a few months after they became aware that, it's, that, that they needed to do something, um, they had a work registration so that Venezuelan migrants could register. And if they registered to get a minister's permit, they could um, allow them to work for a year. And so we've gone through four different things, but it's more of like an ad hoc, reactionary policy. There isn't anything that's up front. And the other thing is, is that in order to get an extension, you have to have already done it for the prior one. So there's a, a narrowing pool of migrants who are eligible to work in this context. The, the education um, issue is even more significant 
um, particularly with the number of children and younger folks who are seeking access to education, who've already lost uh, time because of COVID or because they didn't have the means to go online if they were, if it was even a possibility in, um, in um, Venezuela while they were there. So we're talking about huge gaps in education here for many, many of these children uh, that can't legally attend schools in Trinidad because they're not legally allowed to be there. So um, with regard to criminal justice systems and the Venezuelan migrants, um, the, um, the, we need to recognize the values that we have uh, in, in this context. There are, there are precedents, there are, um, there are ways of managing the, uh, the criminal justice system to be able to work uh, for everyone's favor. Um, they, a lot of the migrants are coming over with significant skills, right? We just have to figure out a way to be able to legalize that process. Um, some of those values include equality and just generally, um, you know, we, if we were in a liberal society, Trinidad and Tobago is a democracy. Um, and most of the, the laws that are in Trinidad and Tobago would be reflective international laws. Here's a gap. And this is sort of when we're talking about the larger value system. Um, as a result, the migrants, asylum seekers and refugees all fall into criminal justice. And so many times they'll be deported without, you know, a serious trial or hearing, you know, the situations, children are being deported. Uh, and there's been a series of issues about basically sort of catch and return. Um, and so um, the legal problem primarily is that there is no migration policy framework, although there are frameworks that could be employed. It just has not been done. And um, the capacity building uh, and the, the public-private collaboration will be discussed further by my colleague, Dr. Shami. So, Dr. Shami, thank you very much for, for handling the slides. So, thank you very much, Dr. Brown, and for laying the context for why what's taking place in Venezuela and consequently the immigration of Venezuela um, migrants, refugees to our borders, Trinidad and Tobago. So in the absence, of course, of a migration framework or approach in place within the Trinidad and Tobago quarters, what we have seen is, and as just um, previously articulated by Dr. Brown, is a number of challenges faced by migrants, Venezuelan migrants and refugees in Trinidad and Tobago. And consequently, what we started to observe is efforts by UN agencies, regional bodies, civil society groups, and NGOs coming together in an attempt to work with not only Trinidad and Tobago, but where you saw a predominance of refugees and migrants from Venezuela within the Latin American Caribbean region. And there was primarily 17 countries uh, where you now have Venezuelan migrants and refugees within the Latin America and Caribbean region. And consequently, you have in 2018, the regional interagency coordination platform, commonly known as the response for Venezuela. And it's the coordinated efforts, as I just mentioned, of UN agency, regional bodies, civil societies groups in response and to support governments of these 17 countries and assist them with some of the challenges um, faced by refugees and migrants within their boundaries. So the response for Venezuela is led primarily by the refugees agencies, namely the International Organization for Migration and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And the idea for this proposed refugee migrant response plan is not while it attempts to address the humanitarian protection and integration needs of migrants and refugees, it is in no way should be looked at as a substitute for government's national response or any country's national response to migrants and refugees. It's a short term development plan that is put in place. And the idea is to see how best it can immediately respond to the socioeconomic needs of migrants and refugees. 
So what are some of the underlying assumptions behind this idea of a response plan for refugees and migrants? The idea is to see how you can support financially and non-financially refugees and migrants within these 17 countries. And, and also, of course, we're looking at this point in time at Trinidad and Tobago. So there is the provision of what we call cash-based interventions, and that's used to assist migrants and refugees, of course, with their purchase of basic amenities. It could come in the form of food hampers. They also receive personal care vouchers and um, assistance with hygiene supplies and kits. Um, we understand that in the near future, there is not really going to be a resolve of the Venezuelan crisis. Um, and as such, the RMRP was designed so that it can provide that social safety net, which is not being provided by governments presently. And we know that with the ongoing pandemic, it has only further exacerbated the situation, not only for migrants and refugees, but also for populations within these 17 countries. So, the major trust of this RMRP is really to see how best it could respond in a very meaningful way and in a very immediate way to the needs of migrants and refugees. So the response priorities primarily focus on preventing, mitigating, and responding to the risks that are faced by refugees and migrants from Venezuela. It's to provide that humanitarian assistance to this vulnerable group of persons within host countries. And how can we increase the resilience of affected communities by improving their livelihood opportunities, whether it be through the basic goods, and how can they work as well with or partner with organizations and NGOs, etc to ensure that necessary services can be provided to this vulnerable group of people and look at ways and means of sensitizing and educating populations on migrants and refugees. So the, the overall objective of this response plan is primarily focused on improving the living conditions of refugees and migrants and seeing how best they could provide a future for them given their circumstances. So the RMRP basically comprises 10 organizations that are partnering. And what they have done is they have focused on different sectors, shelter, health, education, protection and integration. And you have 10 primary organization that partners with NGOs, civil society groups within the TNT context. And I will elaborate a bit more, but let me just um, briefly touch on those 10 groups. So you have the IUM, the International Organization for Migration, which works very closely with um, with your UN women group. And the idea is to see how they could support the needs of gender-based violence victims, how they could provide um, hygienic kits, et cetera. You have UN Habitat, and they're looking at that area of housing. You have UNICEF, and they're primarily focusing on education. You have the Pan-American Development Foundation, and they're looking on integration efforts. And of course, the UNHCR, which does a lot of tremendous work working with partnership organizations um, in, in different sectors, education, community engagement, health, um, looking at health, mental health promotion, um, trying to see how they can partner with different um, units to provide, to, sorry, um, provide psychosocial support. And what we have seen is there are some key partners within the Trinidad and Tobago context that work along not only with the IOM and the UNHCR, but as I've just mentioned, those 10 partners in providing support to this vulnerable group of people within our society. 
So you have the UNHCR, for example, working with the Living Waters community, a Catholic, primarily a Catholic based organization existent in Trinidad and Tobago. And they work along with the UNHCR in providing services in terms of the registration of migrants and refugees. They also provide food hampers, they have food drives, they also offer legal assistance, and they work through what's known as Equal Place Initiative to provide education for children of migrants. Then we have the Flam Family Planning Association of Trinidad and Tobago, and they also work very closely with the International Organization for Migration and UN Women. And they look at ways and means of providing support in the areas of sexual, health, and reproductive um, services, pediatric health care. And what we have observed with the Family Planning Association, for example, they now have a specific hotline geared for migrants that is bilingual, offered for 24 hours. And the idea is to see how you can respond to any health concern they may have. Um, family Planning Association may be sometimes in receipt of matters that are gender-based violence um, oriented or related, and as such, they would liaise with the gender-based violence unit out of the Ministry of National Security and all of our police services of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of reporting and ensuring that the necessary support and assistance is going to be provided to victims of gender-based violence. Um, you also have the Rape Crisis Center, who similarly works with different ministries or units out of different ministries in Trinidad and Tobago. They too have a hotline called Ayudate, and it's bilingual. And the idea is not simply only to be a form of acknowledging and reporting on cases of, of rape, but looking at how they can provide mental health support, have training workshops virtually, and now physically present as we continue to, re to reduce our restrictions in Trinidad and Tobago. So Family Planning Association and the Rape Crisis Society both have been doing extremely critical work in terms of providing the necessary workshops online and physically for these vulnerable groups. And then you have the Pan American Development um, foundation and they work with a number of a number of civil society groups and the idea is to look at we have a migrants and refugees and as my colleague would have mentioned previously while we have different ethnic groups and religious groups represented within our boundaries of Trinidad and Tobago how do we try to address issues of integration and social cohesion between groups of people of Trinidad and our Venezuelan counterparts. And this is where we've had now the support of the Pan American Development Foundation working very closely and having programs and projects designed with the aim of social cohesion and integration. Now, Christopher did mention to you that we do not have a migration framework in place. And as such, a key part of this whole idea of justice for migration has to do with building capacity in particular areas. My subsequent slide speaks to those four areas, political, social, economic, human rights, regional. And what we have observed is in large part, in large part migrants are really not very aware of labor laws, health services, their rights. Uh, and likewise, in the TT context, our citizens are not aware we have different perceptions. We tend to see um, migrants and refugees as intruders, as invaders, and not understanding 
the rules that they can play towards our economy. So there should be capacity building efforts. And Dr. Brown and I are presently working on a paper on this where we explore how can we improve with the support and assistance of civil society groups working in tandem with the government, how can we improve um, efforts in terms of addressing some of these challenges that are faced not only by refugees and migrants, but also by host communities. So the idea could take many forms, and we like to look at it. We have basically character categorized it according to four areas, political, legal, and here we look at concerted efforts in terms of documenting, getting proper paperwork done, because as Dr. Brown would have mentioned, many times these refugees and migrants are fleeing without the appropriate documentation. Who can we properly categorize these migrants? This is very key if we are going to provide provide support and services to them, that they are properly classified. Human rights. It is important for a country to live up to the essence or expectations of the necessary protocols that it has rectified on human rights promotion and protection. So we need to ensure that there is a proper sensitization and education for both migrants and refugees on the rights of children and families, an understanding about gender-based violence and anti-discrimination and xenophobic behavior towards them. So our hosting communities also need to understand that like the citizens, they too have rights, socioeconomic rights. How can we ensure that children of migrants are afforded an education, they can access healthcare, refugees, migrants. How can we make some you know, further inroads into healthcare and proper maternal healthcare for refugees and migrants? How can we presently, our Immigration Act does not have any provision in relation to refugees and migrants. So how can we tweak our legal instruments so that we can afford certain privileges in terms of ensuring there are work permits available to migrants and refugees. And of course, as we have mentioned before, this is not a problem just endemic to the Caribbean or to Trinidad and Tobago. We see it across the Latin American region. So it is important that we try to develop some Caribbean framework so that renders now the support and the collaboration amongst Latin America, the Caribbean and the world to see how we could put an overall system in place for addressing concerns of refugees and migrants. So some of our policy recommendations, this is where Dr. Brown and I are presently at, we're looking now at how we can afford recommendations given the challenges that refugees and migrants are facing. So we are very strong advocates for training and having workshops to sensitize people who are patrolling our borders, namely immigration, custom enforcement agents, custom and, and um, border patrol agents, law enforcement agents, to sensitize them, make sure that they receive the appropriate training on human rights, um, ethics, community relations. Do we have, for example, um, people who are bilingual, or should we introduce forms of bilingual training, introduction to Spanish, so that they could deal appropriately with refugees and um, migrants because they are the first um, receivers of these individuals. How do we ensure that we continue to protect the rights of migrants and their families? How do we move away? We have heard the horror stories about detention centers. So how can we move away from these types of centers and ensure that we do have um, the non-exploitation or abuse of children who are in custody. Um, so there needs to be that greater oversight and accountability 
when it comes to detention centers, if we continue to have those, or we look at or we explore other facilities that can be established to protect the, the rights of children and their families once they are incarcerated. Um, how do we provide adequate legal representation? We hear of stories on a daily basis now in light of the fact that there is a lot of um, discussion presently on child abuse. So how do we have proper representation, not only for children to protect their rights, etc., but to represent these migrants? Um, we are going through a pandemic. What avenues should we create for them so they can have this kind of access and facilitation to legal expertise? And how do we really, really manage and provide proper oversight on this issue of migration. And that's why Dr. Brown and I are really lobbying to have a proper migration and um, framework in place, um, subsumed or under which all these areas can be subsumed. So I will end my presentation here at this point. And on behalf of Dr. Brown and I, we look forward to the Q&A presently. Thank you. Thank you for Matt, very much for that. I think you've um, very much set the scene for a whole load of issues which um, impact on and, and contextualise uh, criminal justice practice uh, in terms of the, the knock-on effect that can um, uh, shape, uh, if you like, the criminalisation of people, vulnerable people, uh, and how we maybe have to think more uh, strategically about that, pro you know, what happens in those circumstances. A, a, a couple of, a couple of, you know, if if you were able to offer, we've only got a couple of minutes left, unfortunately. But if if you were able to offer some advice for if like people who manage, develop policy for criminal justice institutions within Trinidad and Tobago, what would they be, and and how would you effectively bring them in quickly? given the nature of the crisis? It's an open question, unfortunately. So anybody... To, to I'll, I'll, I'll start, if you, Georgina, if you don't mind, just to give you a catch your breath. Um, so, uh, I mean, first and foremost, one of the things I guess we've been beating on is um, there needs to be some sort of legal recognition. There needs to be a framework. Now, that framework already exists. Right? Um, the UNHCR and the IOM have also created um, vast sort of advice, policy frameworks, best practices and things because of their historical experience in dealing with um, dealing with migration. So um, there, there's a whole set of things that could be implemented fairly easily uh, if there was a will to do it. Um, it might not be politically popular uh, at times, especially in light of the pressures of COVID and you know limited resources and things like that, um, but it's not going away. And so it has to be something that it, it needs to be managed. So the first thing we'd have a legal framework um, and then we could begin from there. How do we how do we receive? How do we process? And then how do we support uh, migrants and the host society? So because that le that legal framework has got to identify two things, hasn't it? The uh, protection of the individual who is the migrant, but also the protection of the host community that they are uh, uh, within. How, how do you get that balance right? Well, I mean, ideally, we're talking. You, you'd want to have a triangulation, right? I mean, the folks, the Venezuela, Trinidad, in this case, and and the migrants themselves. So, sort of this, the, the three the three parts of this that need to be managed. Um, you, you know, I'm a big fan of political representation, and I think once there's a legal awareness that this person has a right to sort of be uh, and express themselves, then there's a way of sort of helping. I think to figure out what they what they do need outside of the very basic stuff. Um, you said that the educational profile of many of these migrants is not, you know, this, they could be helpful in a society that also needs to diversify itself. Um, so that there's, there's mechanisms for this, the, the folks are there, but the conditions are getting worse. Many of the folks that are there are also subject to, you know, criminal organizations and, you know, dehumanizing behavior by gangs and things as well. So there's a whole, there's a whole dark side to all of this. Um, that becomes even darker 
I guess, because there's no legal recognition. There's no right for them to, to exist in this place. And so the exploitation. So I think first and foremost, um, there has to be that legal recognition. And then that has to have some meaning, right? Where do we go from there? Yeah. I, think, Chris, you're, I think, Chris, you're, you're really um, introducing another point to the end, you know, which is that de facto in terms of understanding and appreciating um, who are refugees or who are migrants. And then it ties in with this whole conversation on, on the setting the legal parameters. But I think, too, that there needs to be that sort of education and sensitizing on the part of both communities, the host communities and refugee and migrants, you're not an intruder and I am not going to discriminate against you. And I think these conversations have to be held. Um, while we would probably try to stay away from the political dimension, it is really a political dimension and understanding and appreciating and setting you know, um, the context for the integration and acceptance of the refugee and migrants. Yeah. So I think in large part, there is a, a, a large dim political dimension that has to be implemented in terms of showing some level of acceptance and provision for these people and trying to see how best they could work with, you know, your refugee agencies like, and as Chris has rightly said, the legal frameworks are already designed by the IOM and the UNCHCR. The idea is just to see how best we can work with host communities in terms of its implementation. But I think fundamental to this process is in terms of educating and sensitizing on the, you know, on the part of both parties, your host communities and your refugees and migrants, so that there is that level of comfort that could be felt and acceptance. One final question, because we are going to run out of time in a moment, is the um, the role and responsibility for large states to help small states. So here in Europe, obviously, we've got a, a crisis at the moment with the Russia and Crimean war, uh, sorry, yeah, Ukrainian war. And you know the the but the European Union has the space and capacity and economic capability to 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 facilitate and manage some of that movement of refugees, uh, maybe not perfectly, maybe not in a in a, in always a good way. Uh, how how is how is the challenge for a small island state, um, and what kind of messages need to be shared with its larger partners to be able to to help and facilitate? A better response. But I mean, I, if I, I guess I'll step in again real quick. Uh, so um, I think the um, the issues of a smaller state in this context are exacerbated by being a small state, right? Um, capacity is a problem, right? And a lot of the problems that you know the larger states might have in a more spread out context tend to be sort of condensed and in, um, in these places. So. Um, there's not there's not enough funds to be able to manage it. Um, there's not enough resources locally to be able to even the interdiction, the idea of housing folks for any period of time until we figure out their status or the training for the folks to be able to to receive folks of different you know the legal side of all that stuff. Um, tra I mean these smaller places definitely need help. Some of them you know places that are territories uh, or departments of other european states have some benefit there because they are connected to those european powers who are, who are responsible for you know their sovereignty trinidad is sort of on its own now i will say that the united states has a has a special relationship with trinidad um uh it, again in, in re related to venezuela before that and then you know going back through its history so i know that the u.s embassy has been working to sort of help but the unhcr and the supplemental organizations the iom uh, have been very active. They're setting up um, special branches there and everything else to be able to try to provide some of some of the resources to those people, those non-state or you know um, interstate entities, to be able to manage some of these things. So um, they need support, and you know that's one of the first things with anything. We need we need help. We need money. We need resources and these kinds of things. So I think um, these sorts of problems are not. I mean, for for a, a globalized world, we'd like to think about as sort of this, this in, the human rights um, be available should be available to everyone. Um, these are people who are, are sort of there for no fault of their own, right? That there's other forces at work that have put them in the situation. Nobody nobody voluntarily leaves in this situation to find themselves where they are to be trafficked, to be abused, and all that stuff, and you know to suffer like no personal belongings, no paperwork. I mean, this is an awful situation. And so I think this is sort of larger human connection. 
that we can make um, and that there's a moral responsibility, let's say, to facilitate this. Uh, but from a policy perspective, what we find is, you know, if we don't address the situation there, the situation eventually gets to us. You know, we're talking about folks at the border now, at the, at the Mexican border, who are coming up from Central America, from Venezuela, from Colombia because of these issues. So it's, you know, we may buy time because we're not a short pirogue right away, but eventually, you know, it's, it's something we're going to have to deal with. It. So dealing with it now in a capacity that can be managed better is, you know, to me, it's the ounce of prevention might be the wrong word, but an ounce of cure okay. now is going to be worth a whole one, lot. One of the previous there. presentations made a great statement, which was do it right the first time, then you don't have to repeat it. Uh, Georgina, any final words that you can add that might uh, kind of yeah, just encapsulate sure. this? Yeah, sure. So on this whole idea of large states versus small states, you know, I saw in the chat box where somebody was talking about sanctions, for example, being imposed by the new United States and how does that, that definitely contributes, of course, to an exacerbation of the problem in the Venezuelan context. Um, but I think at this point in time, it's very important that as Chris is touching on, that this is a moral and ethical issue and that we really need to not look at it as solely a uh, responsibility for Trinidad and Tobago. This is going to touch every border within our Caribbean context. And that's why Chris and I, you know, exploring this whole idea of regional collaboration and support, because we want to people to recognize that migration will touch on your borders at some point or reach your shores and in very, very, um, very, very soon, I should say. So it's really a subject that needs to be dealt with from a regional perspective as well, inclusive of Latin America. So I will just conclude on that point. I don't know if Chris wants to quickly add anything to what I'm saying there. Unfortunately, I'm going to call time because <laughs> it's, we're well over. So uh, thank you very much for that. It was, it was very detailed and very, very interesting. It illuminated something that I wasn't personally so aware of and you explained it incredibly well. So thank you very much for taking the time and joining us today. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.